Okay, uh, welcome back. We're here looking at this very colorful infinitesimal slice of our capstan from before, and we're trying to balance the forces acting on it. So, um, actually, for the, for the sake of, you know, color overload, I'm not going to switch again. But, okay, so we want to sum up all of the forces acting in the x direction along this axis here. So, to do that, we want to take the components of each of these forces in the x direction, which we can do because we found these angles. So if we make this way the positive x direction, what we have is this force is pushing this way in the positive direction. So we get F cosine d theta over 2. And this force is, is pushing in this direction, so that's minus, minus F plus df cosine d theta over 2. And this force of friction, we're going to say to, okay, well, to good approximation, this force of friction is also just in the x direction, but let's be really nitpicky about it and say um, this angle here will also be d theta over 2, um, if I did my geometry correctly. Well, it's, it's going to be something small, so that's pointing in the, f, in the positive x direction. So f cosine d theta over 2 or something. Now it's it's physically paining me to continue to write these cosine d theta over 2's and um, let me explain to you why that is and why we can just ignore all of these. Um, again, this is going to be review if you've, if you've seen the small angle approximation, so I'm going to switch to this green background and uh, here we're going to talk about small angle approximation and if you're comfortable with that and I'm boring you, then just um, you can skip ahead to where the background is no longer green. But otherwise, this, this is um, a technique when we're considering differentials that will let us deal with those sines and cosines of d theta that are kind of pesky. But um, this comes from the fact that you probably memorized when you were taking single variable calculus um, things like the limit as x goes to zero of sine x over x equals 1, or maybe you also remember something like um, limit as x goes to 0 of cosine x minus 1 over x equals 0, something like that. Well, if you think about these statements, they're equivalent to saying if you multiply both sides by x on this case, that, so, ooh, green's a bad color on a green background. How about, like, hot pink? So if you multiply through by x, you get limit as x goes to 0 of x equals limit as x goes to 0 of sine x. Or over here, um, limit as x goes to 0. Well, if we multiply through both sides by x, that does nothing. And then we can add 1 to both sides. So the limit as x goes to 0 of cosine x equals just 1. And these are kind of helpful because these say that whenever you have a very small variable x, that the sine of that angle, the sine of that variable is very close to the variable itself, and the cosine of that variable is very close to 1. But the angles that we have, which are like d theta over 2, those are really small. And since we're actually letting d theta go to 0 in the limit, they are... For the purposes of this this equation, um, d theta over two is a limit as as theta goes to zero. So in our previous setup, we can we can treat sine d theta over two as exactly equal to d theta over two, and we can treat cosine d theta over two as exactly equal to one. So that will be helpful to us. Okay, so moving back to the actual problem, we can use that knowledge here. Uh, oh, I'm running out of room again. I guess I can go over here. Well, I'll write one more line below it, whatever. So, um, right, all of these cosines are now 1. So we have f minus f plus df plus little f. And since we don't want the rope to be sliding or moving in this direction, the sum of these forces has to be 0. And then we can uh, kind of clean up a little bit and cancel terms. So if we go over here. That means our df equals f, the friction force. 
So that makes sense, because if we don't want this to be sliding, the difference in these two forces has to be exactly equal to this friction force so that nothing moves. But we can figure out what this friction force is by using the fact that when it's at its maximum, F equals mu times the normal force. So if we look at the forces on this increasingly busy diagram in the y direction, since this rope is wound around the cylinder and it has this force on it, the, the rope is pulling on the cylinder up in this direction. So that means the cylinder is exerting a downward normal force on this rope, which must exactly balance these two y components uh, of the forces there. So uh, where can I go? I'm running out of room. Oh, there's a little room over here. Okay, so I'll read it over here. Um, all right, so well, we want to do the same analysis here, except add up all of the forces in the y direction, including this downward normal force that the that the cylinder exerts here. So if we make up our positive y direction, then we have this part pointing up, f plus df sine d theta over 2 um, plus f sine d theta over 2 minus n has to be 0 because it's in equilibrium. It's not moving up or down. And we can use the small angle thingy that we just figured out to um, replace both of these signs with the angles themselves. So we have then f plus df times d theta over 2 plus f d theta over 2 equals n. And here we're going to use another uh, pseudo approximation because since these d thetas and dfs are infinitesimal quantities, we're letting them go to zero in the limit. Um, when you distribute this d theta, you have f d theta over 2 plus df d theta over 2. And that df d theta over 2 contains two differential quantities. So it's the product of two quantities that are both infinitesimally small. They're going to zero. So since uh, what, how they call this in the business is um, first order terms. They say that we're only considering first order terms in this analysis. So this df d theta over 2 would be a second order term. And since that's the square of a really small number or the product of two really small numbers, we can ignore it. Um, all right, so when you do that, we just have f d theta over 2 plus f d theta over 2, which uh, just gives us f d theta. f d theta equals n, our normal force. So that's great, because now we have that. And from there, we're almost done. Um, this, is, this is getting bad. Um, okay, so I ran out of room because I was writing too big again, but I can just... We can just, uh, just edit this in later. So the equations we had were df equals little f, and I think we had like normal force equals f d theta, or something like that. And that was for um, this picture, where here's f, and here's f plus df. So this is theta. Okay. So now we're almost done. This is looking very much now like the problem we had last time because this friction force at its maximum is equal to mu times the normal force. So we can combine those two to write df equals mu times f d theta. And this is just like the differential equation we had in the population model. So we can divide both sides by f to get df over f equals mu d theta. So that's good, because then we can integrate, and let's see if we can, there we go. So now we have on this side that the log of f equals simply mu times, oops, just mu times theta, since mu doesn't depend on theta. So now, like before, we can exponentiate both sides. Oh, right, constant. Uh, exponentiate both sides. So we raise e to the power of both sides. And then we finally have 
moving this constant out as a coefficient again. We have c times e to the mu theta. Okay, so we have to remember what this equation is actually telling us. So that f is this f here. So this is like, you could call this the f, uh, the f hold, I guess you could say. Because if you remember, the f hold was on this side, and the f load was on this side. So this theta measures the angle here going in this direction between the hold force and the load force. So that's good. Now to determine this constant c, we need to think about the large scale problem again. So we had the whole capstan, and over here we had some large load force. Over here we had some smaller hold force and we're measuring our angle from the hold force to the load force because of the way the way that I drew that. So when our angle is zero, if this angle theta is zero, then we're looking right at the hold force. So when theta equals zero, e to the zero is one. So the force that we get there has to be the hold force. So we have that C has to be the hold force. And now, what color is appropriate for our triumph? How about a green? Let's type this type of setup. So, remember that this is, uh, this, this f here is an f of theta. It's a function of theta. So, if we let theta be the theta in the diagram, which is this whole angle here, then the force that we get out is the load force. So we can just say that the load force, which is f of theta, equals the hold force times e to the mu theta. And that's our answer. So this hold force and load force are actually, actually connected by an exponential relationship in, in, both the, in both the coefficient of friction and the angle. And I thought that was really cool, because um, if you look up this equation in Wikipedia, um, it'll tell you that for a certain coefficient of friction and a certain theta number of times wrapped around, you could have like a, a baby lifting up two U.S. supercarrier warships sort of things because of this exponential relationship. And clearly at that point, um, whatever cylinder you have would break because of the ridiculous amount of force on it. But, but still, this is, um, this is a really cool really cool sort of equations. So, um, so yeah, I hope you enjoy watching that derivation. And, uh, and so the next time you need to lift something heavy, make sure you connect it to a rope that's wrapped around a cylinder. So bye-bye for now.